ultimately, I think like two ingredients are enough for alignment. And that is, first of all, open individualism is this idea that we're all one consciousness or maybe we're all the field of consciousness and each of us is kind of like a different expression of it. And then the other component is uh, valence realism that, hey, actually the thing that determines whether an experience is worth living or not is its uh, valence. I think um, that might be enough because if you have that perspective, then actually others are suffering is your suffering. So like from a purely rational perspective, it makes a lot of sense to minimize the suffering in the world because it's, it's your suffering, you know, factory farms and oppression and <laughs> uh, kidney stones and all of that. It's, it's, is the problem of the field is like the same problem for everybody. Um, and also you cannot kind of like be in a state of denial about that suffering. I mean, like that is the other thing. Like I do know a lot of people who like, okay, maybe they believe we're all one, but then they are kind of like, well, but everything is perfect as it is. Or they might say something like, um, yeah, but like suffering is entirely relative. Like there's no absolute reason why it shouldn't exist or something like that. Whereas valence realism says like, no, 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 like, look, to know what suffering is, you need to experience it. And whenever you experience it, you want it to end. So actually you want it to end, whether you know it or not, <laughs> it's more kind of like this epistemological, um, uh, it's an epistemological limitation, essentially. Like the reason why you're not urgently trying to help somebody who's experiencing suffering is because you're not sufficiently aware of it. And if you were more aware of it, you would actually try to end it. It's essentially something like that. So in that case, yeah, I think like you get alignment, but you do get like very strange things. I mean, essentially you get things such as like, um, well, maybe the best for the universe is for it to become a hedonium shockwave, you know, or something like that, which I'm not in principle opposed to. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm even wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> it's like... Um, I mean, I just think it's like a possi possibility, like that might be actually the the best. Like it's very strange and doesn't sound very human compatible, but like ultimately that might not matter because what matters is the well-being of consciousness. Now, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be a hedonium terrorist or something like that. Like just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, th I, think, I think we need to be more intelligent and like know a lot more about consciousness before like making you know, irreversible decisions or anything like that. But the problem too is that like, if you don't go the path of like alignment uh, of the sort that I'm talking about, there are like other risks that are like really, really bad. Like uh, essentially like identifying with your genes, your own genes and that's it. Or if you identify with your culture and that's it, or you identify with your memories or something like that. All of a sudden you're going to try to you're going to try to adjust the rest of the universe for that very limited conception of yourself. <laughs> and at the limit, you know, that looks like an emperor, you know, who's controlling the rest of the universe just to like have a slightly better experience themselves. Right. But like to me, that that comes out of ignorance about the nature of reality. <laughs> it is more kind of like extrapolating a delusion of a particular view of the self. Um than like an honest inquiry into what what actually exists. So this sounds like ethics stops being subjective or relative, but becomes grounded in real substantive truths about identity and consciousness and valence. Absolutely. Yeah. Ethics becomes a, a very empirical and rigorous task at that point. Uh, but I, I would say that it is actually more complicated than people make it out to be and not for the reasons that people make it out to be. Like, I have an article on the EA forum. Uh, I was very happy that like Scott Alexander linked to it, actually, which is about like um, how the science of consciousness and philosophy of mind influence ethics. And the thing is like, okay, like my overarching claim is that a lot of ethicists and philosophers are commenting on the phenomenon of value without looking at the phenomenon of value, right? Like the, whether it's like the trolley problem or the repugnant conclusion by Parfit or all of those thought experiments, they have just such a simplistic view of like well-being. Whereas like if you actually examine it empirically, it's like, oh my gosh, there's like a lot of weird things that also go on in the realm of valence. 
one of them, one of the simple weird things is uh, mixed valence. The fact that like if you have like a very unpleasant sensation simultaneously with a very pleasant sensation, somehow that gives rise to kind of like a kind of like cancellation of the global valence, even though locally they are different. And I think like it's kind of an open question whether we should prefer neutral experiences or mixed experiences. Um, personally, <laughs> I actually would prefer mixed experiences over neutral experiences if they add up to the same valence, but I don't know how to justify that. I, I mean, I suspect there is a way to to to. I mean, in the end, what I'm driving driving towards is that I think that until we have the mathematics of valence and consciousness, uh, all these questions will be like strange and kind of uh, idiosyncratic and subjective. But I have the strong intuition that like once we actually have the mathematics, the solutions will come just right out of the math. And, and we will hopefully all agree on them because they're just entailed by the math. And I mean, the things like the repugnant conclusion and things like that, I think also requires, I mean, both an understanding of aliens and also personal identity. I mean, I mean, I think like, yeah, something like the, the one electron universe, uh, an open individualism gives you ways of actually start to sort, sorting this out. It might not be enough, but like it's, it's an entry point.